Tonight, we get to enjoy the company of the 2022 Larry Levis Poetry Prize winner and the 2022 Richard Scowcroft Prize in Prose winner, uh, Max Schleicher and Corley Miller, respectively. Before we begin our event, uh, the guest writer series acknowledges that the land upon which the university is located and which is named for the Ute tribe is the, tra the tra traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous people and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. The Guest Writer Series is supported by the University of Utah's English Department and the Office of the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Guest Writer Series has received funding from Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks and Utah Humanities, which empowers groups and individuals to improve their communities through active engagement in the humanities. The series is also, in part, supported by Utah Arts and Museums, with funding from the State of Utah and the National Endowment for the Arts. I'd also like to thank our hosts this evening, Salt Lake City Arts Council here at Finch Lane Gallery. Uh, before we move on to the festivities, I'd like to take a moment to welcome Sadie Hoagland, who is the incoming Guest Writer Series Coordinator. <clears throat> For those that don't know, Sadie is an alumna of our Creative Writing PhD program uh, and will be a great advocate, I'm sure, having gotten to know her, a uh, great advocate for our program and a dedicated steward of the Guest Writers Series. Uh, I'm thrilled that she's here and I look forward to working with her this spring as she settles into the position. So when you get a chance, make sure to introduce yourselves and kindly welcome her here. Um, okay, now let's get on with the program. I'd like to invite Jackie Oshro up to introduce Max Schleicher. Thank you. You know, as I was preparing this introduction, I remembered that it, when we introduced the Larry Levis Prize winner, for years, we'd read a poem by Larry Levis. And really, this meant a great deal to me, because not only is Larry a very fine poet, but he was a lovely person, very generous, and exceedingly kind to his extremely junior colleague. And um, so I asked Alan and Michael if I could read one of his poems tonight. They've indulged me. I hope you'll indulge me as I read one of my favorites of his poems. Winter Stars by Larry Levis. My father once broke a man's hand over the exhaust pipe of a John Deere tractor. The man... Ruben Vasquez wanted to kill his own father with a sharpened fruit knife, and he held the curved tip of it lightly between his first two fingers so it could slash horizontally and with surprising grace across a throat. It was like a glinting beak in a hand, and for a moment, the light held still on those vines. When it was over, my father simply went in and ate lunch, and then, as always, lay alone in the dark, listening to music. He never mentioned it. I never understood how anyone could risk his life, then listen to Vivaldi. Sometimes I go out into this yard at night and stare through the wet branches of an oak in winter and realize I am looking at the stars again a thin haze of them, shining and persisting. It used to make me feel lighter looking up at them. In California, that light was closer. In a California no one will ever see again, my father is beginning to die. Something inside him is slowly taking back every word it ever gave him. Now, if we try to talk, 
I watch my father search for a lost syllable as if it might solve everything. And though he can't remember now the word for it, he is ashamed. If you can think of the mind as a place continually visited, a whole city placed behind the eyes and shining, I can imagine now its end as when the lights go off one by one in a hotel at night until at last all of the travelers will be asleep or until even the thin glow from the lobby is a kind of sleep. And while the woman behind the desk is applying more lacquer to her nails, you can almost believe that the elevator as it ascends must open upon starlight. I stand out on the street and do not go in. That was our, our agreement at my birth. And for years I believed that what went unsaid between us became empty and pure like starlight and that it persisted. I got it all wrong. I wound up believing in words the way a scientist believes in carbon after death. Tonight, I'm talking to you, Father, although it is quiet here in the Midwest where a small wind the size of a wrist wakes the cold again, which may be all that's left of you and me. When I left home at 17, I left for good. That pale haze of stars goes on and on, like laughter that has found a final silent shape on a black sky. It means everything it cannot say. Look, it's empty out there and cold, cold enough to reconcile even a father, even a son. There are seats. Come sit down. <laughs> Everybody had their seats. Good. <laughs> OK. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce Max Schleicher, a poet fearless in his willingness to enter uncharted poetic territory. He explores the connection between digital spaces and poetry and uses traditional forms quite deftly to engage with non-traditional subject matter. He finds beauty and sometimes even energy in the abandoned factories of his post-industrial Midwest. His poetic engagement with the cities that surround those factories puts me in mind of the work of the great Canadian photographer Edward Brzezinski, who made exquisite visual art out of ecological disaster. His photos were beautiful, but the disasters remained catastrophic. Max is particularly agile at walking this same aesthetic tightrope in his poems. And he's extremely ambitious for them. He wants them to improve his imperfect world, even as he finds in that same world plenty of sources of celebration. Though a poet of cityscapes, Max gives us memorable interactions with nature, all the more memorable because they happen against a backdrop of the dilapidated and the man-made. Here's an example from his poem, Lupin. From the city, we take the first South Shoreline train and walk past brick piles, auto shops, and the faded Main Street murals of an unincorporated town annexed by Gary, Indiana. We arrive at the improbable wooded entrance for the newest national park, half forest, half dune land, terrain slipshod, wind-folded sand, cinders soft. It is the middle of May. Wildflowers spark. It's also the only week the lupin bloom fully. These lupin, we're later told, give off the smell of ironing clothes. Max is never far from the work of being human. Indeed, he even extends that humble and painful and unglamorous work to poets. He tells us, Basho wrote with pine needles in his elbow and lice in his hair. Clearly, Basho 
wasn't on a Stephenson Cannon Fellowship <laughs> as Max is. So I'm hopeful that Max can manage to avoid the pine needles and lice. His poems have appeared in many publications, including two anthologies of new poems from the Midwest, Midwest Review, North American Review, and Poetry. Please join me in welcoming Max Slifer. <laughs> When Alan told me I was going to go first, I was really glad I wouldn't have to follow Corley. But instead, I just have to follow Larry Levis. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. How is, uh, how's the volume? Does that all sound good? Great. <clears throat> um, as Jack alluded to, I'm going to read a lot of poems that are sort of uh, Midwestern poems. Um, and uh, this first poem uh, is called Super Tramp Number 80. And... Uh, when I've read this poem before, afterwards, people always want to talk to me about Supertramp. And I don't know that much about Supertramp, so <laughs> I'm just going to preemptively tamp your enthusiasm um, <clears throat> in case you're one of those people. Anyway, Supertramp number 80. I was from Indiana originally. Now I'm from here. I was a time of elegy comfortable in the strength of its voice. Thinking about that as a sin was a summer I spent sweating on a vinyl mattress case. I was my name. Turtling the river, deliverer of pho, jasmine, lime. A job with Postmates this summer I used night cream for the very first time and my skin was glowing. A very old man with enormous cheeks coughed out his freckles. Light bulbs shook, he paid for pho, tipped, and didn't realize he sang, give a little bit. Give a little bit of your life to me. There are many ways to get the words wrong. This is Super Tramp number 80. I, um, that was, uh, you know, like many of you, I sent out my manuscript and had it rejected constantly. And one time, uh, like, uh, one of the readers for the contest, like, sent me a follow-up, and he's like, man, send me that super tramp poem. I, I'm a reader, or I'm an editor at this magazine. So I did, and then he didn't publish it. <laughs> and I, I like to think that's just because that's kind of like, maybe that's like the nature of super tramp. You're like, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a band. And then you listen to it, and you're like, oh, not for me. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> okay. Um, this next poem uh, is called Stays, uh, Stays Light So Late. It's about the sun in Chicago. The dead have the whole city to think with. The flavor ice tube, the whole tongue, cherry red. Trapped below the lake, the slow, sharp breath, the mottled dog skin, the fiberglass, the uncertain water lights advance. This is the uniformity we imagine the future with. This the future that came late. But when it did, set gray panels and tan brick and churred with a whippoorwill trapped in the Walgreens door. This is a city destined to look like nothing more than someone dying on television full of wonder. Forgive me talking about them twice. The dead go diving, and there is the light splitting their eyes. There is the lake carrying their names. Something slips from them, and we see the waves. <clears throat> yeah, so most of these poems are going to be this, this sort of post-industrialist Midwest, and, and uh, this one's uh, about my, my hometown of Milwaukee. And it's called Dream Below Houses. I was there, and the river was there everywhere, and the dead leaves dewed to its shores, and the cracks in its sides, and old valley walls widened by quarries that are gone, and quarrymen that are gone now too. In the road edge, lit with a snail track, and the accumulations of string gear plugs and curbside cigarettes left from late shifts and low houses with plastic on front windows to seal themselves from foundry dust and the explosion at Fault Corporation that dented the fire station door a mile and a half away and the fish flat as butter knives that died gasping after following big ships from north on the lake. They're not used to the warmth of the harbor and the coyote that limps in the quarry carve out to sun himself on Christmas morning and the fox that eats the birds that die frozen to the lake in a snap. I was there with the river and a friend at the Protestant shelter that gave us food for believing we were not to blame for the state of our lives and for accepting the state of Lord Jesus Christ as we prayed and slept in a dormitory with 20 bunks full of men flatulent and masturbating. 
and I saw the invisible heart of Jesus Christ. Like a jellyfish, it stung me. Like ticks, I had it in the seams of my jeans. Like an arrowhead, it dug into the flesh above my ankle. And I told Jesus, listen, if you come by me, use the side door or the back, never the front. The side or the back is for family. I was talking to Anthony over here before, and he said he read that poem, and it just like made him laugh. <laughs> and I, I appreciate that, and I told him, I was like, yeah, I know. Like, you're Filipino, you grew up Catholic like me, and we know that, that Jesus appears in mysterious ways. <laughs> the mysteries are complicated. Um, <clears throat> all right, this poem's called Bauhaus. Uh, 28 minutes left, and the river is Bauhaus, and a god living slowly, steadily, not feared but worshipped for its plausibility. Each day I approach the north branch. The river is a series of renovations confronting me. I am impressed. I'm a workman who has left new windows overnight in the grass. By accident, I cross-section the night with the work tomorrow's renovation demands. It's Michigan Avenue down the river, but here, the Bauhaus stone stares under glass, and there is casual upscale dining. Each day, each day, each day I take my break on the north branch, and the river is a series of renovations. I come away impressed. Um, <clears throat> this next poem is about a movie theater around the corner from where I grew up. Um, it's called Time Cinema. On 59th and Belief, the cinema shares a wall with the bakery and the parking lot with the dry cleaners, where the cinema owner's mother crosses the asphalt as she comes back from the dead and unlocks the lobby door with the keys left hanging there. She rips my ticket, twisting it before she's able to tear through, just as she did throughout my adolescence. She sweeps the air above the ticket counter, flicking at it as one might a fly, and gestures me past the doors where I lower into a seat whose cushion has been worn thin by the weight of many bodies. Its hard, black lip pushes against my hamstring. She and I are the only ones who will come into the theater today. The door to the projection booth clicks, and I hear her coughing and moving slowly in the dark, high, in the dark, high and far behind me. The machines have been waiting for her in that room, and they begin to whir as she plays the old movies. She plays the third man, which she surprised me with once on a cold day when they had, when they had to resort to playing this movie, because the one that was supposed to arrive, a French film, which I still have never seen, was never delivered. I watch Orson Welles push his fingers through the sewer grating, trying to shove it loose. Just as he touches the dry leaves on the street, he is shot and dies. She plays the apartment, and Jack Lemmon strains spaghetti through a tennis racket. She plays movies I only vaguely remember, a Polish one about a child who is beaten and who beats his parents, a Taiwanese film about the slowness of time and the frightening redness of a piece of candy. She plays me many movies I can't even remember, playing them in fact because I won't remember them in exactly the same way I failed to the first time. She is able to do things like this because she's no longer living and now understands certain things better than she did or understands them not at all, having lost a feel for them, the way she has for the sound of the heating coming on or the way the door handles stick to the sweat of my hands after I've removed my gloves on a cold day like today. So I sit there, feeling no weight, feeling the hard lip of the seat no longer pushing against my leg, but holding me instead, holding me and in fact, helping me to sit perfectly in that space in the dark. And finally, after she's played the last of the great movies I saw there, one which I still don't understand, she begins to play images of the cinema itself, showing me the speaker hanging in the bathroom, the tile pattern, the plug for the jukebox in the lobby, the metal plates that form the corner to the glass popcorn machine, the light of the traffic reflecting off the candy under the counter. This, it is clear to me, is the only language she has left. She can barely lift her hands at this point in the night. Her coughing is more regular, and I know I should leave. I walk out the back way, leaving her alone in the booth. I walk up the unlit ramp and into the darkness toward the door that will push open heavily into the night. A door which has changed, I know, but which I still think is the last part of her life and the beginning of my own. Um, <clears throat> read another quick poem here. 
This one's called the smell of sugar. If not these, what were the signs the flood had passed? The heart the Lord plucked wept alight, a perfume card rubbed down her neck. Skipping the line, the Lord said, I give you at long last the intruder fantasy that made the coast industrialist. Peach rings, sour gummies, sugar dots on paper for 49 cents. You try and you try, but I alone try the reins, the Lord said, biting a rope of chewy cherry licorice, pulling out the Egyptian cotton thread. I'm going to read um, two sections here um, from a long poem I wrote, and um, uh, the the poem uh, is called Legacy City, and, and I wrote this poem. And I was, you know, as you, as you probably are getting some from my other poems, like I am fascinated by the the Upper Midwest, and one of the reasons I think that's so interesting to me is like not just you know where I'm, and not just that it's home for me, which obviously is you know huge for all of us or our homes, but the, I think it's so interesting and so striking to be in a place that is like the physical metaphor of like a failure of capitalism for the last 70 years. And, you know, for as much as we talk about, like I was thinking about it today, like I forget exactly how many people have moved to uh, Salt Lake in the last decade, but it's like 10,000 people or something. It's like a lot of people. But like, like where I'm from, Milwaukee lost 400,000 people in like 30 years or whatever. People moving to the suburbs, people leaving, and that's very typical for all of these places, you know places that have like less than half the population they once had when they were, you know, when manufacturing was different uh, in those areas. And so it's really interesting, I think, to be in a place like that, also in an era of like less than like vast amounts of overproduction and vast amounts of sort of technological and digital uh, cultural excess. And so I think that that's always been fun for me to sort of be writing in those two, in, the, in those two kind of spaces, the physical space of post-industrial and then the excessive space of the, the digital. And so in this long poem, um, I think this is kind of where I've really kind of focused on that. And so um, I'm going to read the first two sections of, that, of this poem. And the first one here is called I Am Immortal. And uh, it takes its name from the Highlander uh, television show. <laughs> I am immortal. All emotion is pleasure. Remember that. Hard for me not to fanboy over you. Your robot eyes flicker to violet and marshmallow to you that seem to chide us. Don't say that. It's just a little harmless virus. Rain and fire wimpled decal stickers stuck across the video game box. So the hero must travel seven ages to repair the seven cosmic clocks. The spread of opiates and other exogenous shocks led to a rise in what we termed deaths of despair. Basho wrote with pine needles in his elbow and lice in his hair. Celebrating five years sober, he spilled his lime in Topo Chico, saw the sky crust over the first summer of streaming video. Sword fighting, broken jaws, cracking and chains of the quickening. This isn't a joke, Richie. I am immortal. I remember everything. Been paying much attention to this story? Not a ton, but I am aware. You were so excited about the millennial fair, you didn't sleep, did you? The term legacy from legacy software described our city as obsolete, unsupported technology. The printer driver, and clouds puddled like dirty cat poop. As we were walking, the smell of yeast pushed down the air, wrinkling the pages of your character sheet. O clement, O loving, O true love, one and sweet. You, the young, quick-talking, heavy feet, told me, going to Burger King and ordering Beyond Meat doesn't exactly make you a priest, okay? <laughs> you say we've known each other a decade, but immediately I think 18 years, because I'm counting because I crashed at a house in River West, you helped me find sheets when I came back at 5 a.m., found myself drunk in a stranger's linen closet, and you held my arm tight and closed the door so no one would wake up from the light. This old man stopped me outdoors at the exercise equipment at Washington Park, saying he had many belts, kung fu, and strong fingers. Punch like this, he said. Fingers out, think Bruce Lee, a one-inch punch. Now, at the same time, put your hand here. We'll punch at the same time. Ready? And then he said, boom, I hit you in the throat first. Look at me, 82-year-old man, and your Adam's apple's crushed. <laughs> An oak savanna gives way to stubble field. Sparrows startle as the rat terrier wheels and finds a dead heron, bones barely decipherable from yellow grasses. The sea was gone, the river still ahead, 
How did it get here? The waiting bird dead so far from water. A minor mystery I almost missed. My pocket shaken as a friend texts, Ian McKellen teaches Cookie Monster to resist. And then uh, this is uh, the next section in that, in that poem. And I've called it uh, Perfect Strangers. Because I also like the way so many sitcoms are set in the Midwest. <clears throat> Perfect Strangers. Strangers devour this land in their absence. The legacy city is empty. Another land is full. Wind down the tollway shakes the gantry. The heart comes to a point. Empty set, no. At the Lake Forest Oasis, our heart eats honey, walnut, shrimp, and black pepper Angus. Wind down the tollway shakes the gantry. Strangers devour this land in their absence. Traveler, long may you tarry at the Panda Express. Long, <laughs> long may you take to clear your tray. Now, traveler, push on, and long may your hands adjust to the wind steering down the tollway. This is our lament. Sweet fire, chicken breast, burns on reentry. <laughs> Strangers devour this land in their absence. Born in the city, I was conceived in the cold forest. Snow wet my mother's back. She carried me nine months. Nine months, the land's long slack grew tight until a whiff of wet cement broke through the ice, and she, without great passion. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I was born a change of scenery. The change reversed decades of progress and mortality. No other rich country saw such marked effect. Slippered my feet to calm the map for hours, draw, let dry the cooling action, plant the wart strips. Significant midlife deterioration on the, on the order of a two to three point dip. Mind blowing. Gratitude's correlation to happiness is significant. Received an accidental screen time from my sister. Reheated the wedding shift from the, from the fister. Chicken breast, rye roll with jam. Live and die by one rule. Every meal needs something extra. A bowl of cereal, dragging my fingers through Insta. It'll be at Anvil slash Lost Lake. And I had seen something slip between Knight and my former housemate. So as she departed, uh, so as she departed, my hologram began to shake. A reunion at Tiki Bar next week? Too late for me. I was leaving the city for an Airbnb in the mountains near where they filmed Twin Peaks. I was leaving and at no charge. I was the way the world only seems approachable through homage. And it's like, did you know there are 27,000 Netflix categories and only 4,000 movies? They pulled drawbridges over the city to keep out protesters, and I saw them. One, a dark mystery. One, a visually stunning indie workplace drama. One, an award-winning docu-series. And one, open the river with a day glow softball in its teeth. In the morning, my glasses resting on the laptop and springing in to their watch. I listen, the red and black dog where the bush twitches. I hear, in one eighth of a second, more pitches than any instrument. The cardinal devours the space between branches. It was here, then here, and then gone. I ducked the low tree, and crossing the river, heard, but was unable to see the fisherman singing his song. And I'll read uh, one more poem for you guys. And this one is at least partially inspired by Utah, so it's a transition year now. <clears throat> uh, it's called Mountains and Hills. Today we have passed the event horizon for that 70s show, farther from its premiere than the year of the kicks. Take this opportunity to reflect how, in winter, they will shelter together under snow, as the next Twitter caption elegizes the American tree sparrow. Truest things are often expressed in jest. Aphorisms grow on me, as does the ballad version of Love Kills. Today, I have come to prove myself to you, so I have selected all images of mountains and hills. Thanks. Thank you so much, Max. That was amazing. My name is Lindsay Drager. I'm here to introduce our second and final reader for tonight, Corey Knight. There is an urgency 
through Corley Miller's work, a sense of the narrator needing to tell and tell quickly and tell it all. This is the case in processing the 2022 Scowcroft winning story. The narrator, who adopts a somewhat tween-like logic, conveys a story about, on the one hand, experiences as they manifest in and leave a trace on human memory, and on the other hand, the brief and fleeting nature of internet fame. It's not a secret to those of us who have engaged with Corley's work that he is interested in questions of the contemporary, of what it means to live in a given here and now. And the technical choices in Corley's stories might make the case that the contemporary is a condition characterized by urgency. His work is often in present tense and sentences employ phrases joined with multiple conjunctions, creating a sense of propulsion, of running out of time. The narrators are often a little bit critical of, or exhausted by, or indifferent toward the story's characters, as if narrating itself is taking too long, creating in the reader a heightened sense of suspicion about the narrator, and therefore, I find, empathy for the characters under the narrator's control. And that empathy for the characters is palpable, as they are often smart and savvy people who fail because they won't slow down and digest, won't stop and look around them, take time to be in the moment rather than on the move. By failing to do so, they often discover that what they desire, love, notoriety, a concrete understanding of themselves, has already slipped, is already slipping away. In short, they won't process, aren't processing the world around them, and this is precisely the central conflict of the story processing a cautionary tale about the danger of succumbing to the urgency of now. The central characters, nearly but not yet teenagers, <coughs> Carla and Naomi, have recently been witness to and victims of a school shooting, but in the wake of this trauma are more concerned with creating content that will increase the number of comments on their TikTok posts than coming to understand what they've just been through. In short, they are failing to process their experience. Or, alternatively, perhaps they are doing so, but in a way that raises questions about what processing and its adjacent goal, getting over it, actually means. As news of the shooting and images of the victims make their way into social media, the story's question becomes less about whether the girls will find a way to face and cope with trauma, and more about what conditions have created in them a desire to have witnessed living online, to have been witnessed living online, rather than to actively be living <coughs> off of it. Ultimately, the girls face themselves in a figurative mirror, and in doing so, they create via destruction, generate content for their social media by engineering a disaster, this time one that takes place not at school, but at home. The result is a story about what lasts and what is lost, and perhaps more interesting, in the aftermath of such creation via destruction, who and what forces should be held accountable. Quote, everything you love will disappear forever, claims the ghost, who could in fact be the girls in processing, except perhaps on the internet, Corley Miller suggests. It is the internet that the ultimate site of processing, where we are always living, but possibly never quite alive. <laughs> It is without further ado that I introduce to you the 2022 Scowcroft winner, Coralie Miller. Um, are we happy with the mic? Broadly speaking, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, if I were to express thanks to each of you by name, we'd be here all night. But I would like to say um, how much I cherish this community and how lucky I've been to work in the Vermont over the past couple of years. Um, I've grown a lot here, and the Prose faculty in particular, I want to mention by name, uh, Lindsay Drager and Michael Mejia, have each helped my work a great deal with their kind attention. And while I haven't worked as much with Lance Olson, um, I've recently been thinking very gratefully about his curiosity, playfulness, and rigor that he brings to our community. Um, I'm so glad to have had the chance to learn from all of you. For me, putting something together tonight was a little challenging. I don't usually read for this long, and I'm not super convinced that fiction, read front to back, is all that great at readings. You end up reading a lot of exposition, and if you don't, people are sitting there with questions like, who is Ahab, and what are the whale's <laughs> motivations? 
As I looked through the work that I've done here at Utah, I noticed that I'm often writing about the ambiguous viability and desirability of a life in the arts as it's felt available to myself and my generation. I think that's a terribly important conversation, but it can be tricky to have in a space where so many other people are carrying the exact same strain. For me, it seems to come out in my work. So what I've put together today is a group of passages that offer some different perspectives on the way so many of us are attempting to live. It's organized around that Scowcroft winning piece called Processing that Lindsay told you about, um, which is about two girls making TikToks in a haunted house. But I've also added a couple of thematically resonant pieces from a novel and a novella that share similar concerns. Lately, Lindsay has been accusing me of being an essayist, and I very much hate to support her argument, but I think what I'm presenting to you tonight is a found essay in search of optimism. Whether, at the same time, it is more a parataxical ars poetica or a cry for help is a question for each of you to answer. <laughs> and seriously, if you do answer, let me know, because I'm, man, I could use the help. Uh, this is the beginning of processing. It turns out there is a ghost in the new house in Big Bear. It's ghost-shaped and ghost-colored and lives on the third floor, and you see it when you're getting ready for bed, but only if you is Carla and Naomi. Ghost-shaped means person-shaped, but ghost-colored means all white. The ghost floats up behind them with its dead face and makes a toothbrushing motion with its dead hand or a face cleansing motion. Carla sometimes hopes that if she washes her face the right way, she will find a different face underneath, maybe more like Naomi's, but that's never how it works. The ghost doesn't have a future or skin or a toothbrush, but it keeps washing its face after they're done. The bathroom on the third floor has turquoise tiles and a big counter where Carla keeps her toothbrush, and Naomi keeps eight different jars and tubes and sprays that she lets Carla use, but only sometimes. The tiles are twice the size of the tiles in the school bathroom, but there's no drain in the floor. Carla's mother is a consultant. She says, there isn't a ghost up there because there's no such thing as ghosts. Aren't you feeling better? Carla's father is in real estate. He says, ghosts are market inefficiencies. How do you think we got this huge place so cheap, honeybee? Come give me a kiss before bed. He also says they won't be there long because they're just redoing the floors so they can flip it. Naomi's parents don't have opinions about the ghost because Naomi's father is on a shoot in Belize and Naomi's mother is not feeling well which is why Naomi has been staying at Carla's even before the incident. Carla's cousin Catherine says, it probably has a good reason for being a ghost. Why do you think someone would want to be a ghost? The ghost says, everything you love will disappear forever. This next bit is from a novel called Zombies. Here we're with Nora, a hardworking artist who hasn't caught many breaks and is leaving a party where one of her friends, Annie, seems to be succeeding. Nora stumbles on the stairs. She tries to laugh about it. No one's there to hear her laugh. She takes her heels off and keeps climbing. The stairs are cold under her feet. When she gets to the third floor, it looks ordinary. Not six hours ago, she'd been overwhelmed. The beauty, the luxury. She's sure she's supposed to feel guilty on one side of that arrangement, but she's too exhausted to say which side. She has a lot to do up here, getting Annie's purse and her own bag, which she left in one of the cabinets, and change back into the overalls. They're hanging by the big shower from earlier. She wants to take another one, but no, she's got to get Annie's purse back. She slips the straps of the dress off her shoulders and steps out of it. Then she's naked, looking in the mirror. She doesn't take the time to inspect herself. It wouldn't help anything. But the overalls. There's a little stain on one calf, and when she tents it open for a leg, there's a draft of sour smell. Nora works not to cry. She knows the smell is hers. She wants not to hate it, but she won't be back. She thinks she won't be back to parties like this, houses like this, dresses like this. Annie will spend her whole life here, and Nora won't. That's clear now, anyway. Annie's done with her. She likes these people and the ease they offer. Nora's never offered any ease. She's never had enough to spare, never enough for herself either. How nice it would have been, though, if it had worked out. What a dream it would have been. Some people get what Nora wants. Nora just never figured out how to make herself one of them. But it's fine. It's really fine. She'll be Nora. She'll have a small life, an ordinary life. She'll buy a big hat. She'll go to the farmer's market. She'll collect teas. She'll go to bed early. And she won't be haunted by it, by what she wanted and didn't get. She'll just decide to want something else, and it'll work. She'll be tough and make it work, and she won't be haunted at all. It's not the time for her to make art. It's not the time for her to be famous. She happens to have a little talent and a little time to work on it, just enough to waste a life. At a certain point, you put the overalls back on, is all. You recognize that you're going to stop renting dresses and have an overalls life. Here's another passage from Processing, around the middle. <laughs> when Carla wakes up, it is still gray outside. She lies in bed and tries to imagine everything disappearing forever. It's easy. Then she tries to imagine everything she loves disappearing forever. That's hard. In order to imagine it, first she has to decide what she loves. Her parents, and Naomi, and her phone, and the pillow under her head with the dolphin pattern. But what about the pillow next to her with the pillow pattern? Does she love that? Either it is possible to love things, or it is impossible, or it is a duty. If the ghost is right, you can only save things from disappearing by refusing to love them. 
Carla lies in bed trying not to love everything she most wants to survive, but it gives her a headache. Maybe when she's more mature. They can't find the ghost, so they focus on the e-girl trend. Naomi isn't an e-girl, and she can't do the fingers right, but that's part of the joke. Then they do TikToks where Carla trips over things. Then they get bored and decide to invent ghost-themed games. They invent floor is ghosts and truth or ghost, which is like truth or dare, except you always say ghost, and then get a ghost-related dare. The last game they invent is called Disappear Forever and Go Seek. Carla tries to win at Disappear Forever and Go Seek by hiding in the closet, but it's full of weird brooms. From the crack at the bottom of the door, she watches the shadow Naomi makes going back and forth looking for her. When Naomi stops, Carla knows that she is sending DMs to Justin Violette, which is an unfair way to play Disappear Forever and Go Seek. If nobody seeks you, of course you disappear forever. It occurs to Carla that if you are the one disappearing forever, you do not want to win the game. This passage is from near the end of Zombies, when Nora has decided to give up on making art. Nora buys eight ounces of lemon hummus, buys a raspberry lemonade and a jar of raspberry cilantro salsa from a family stall with a cartoon raspberry printed on its awning. The raspberry is meant to look gleeful, but there's something in the eyes, an asymmetric squint. Nora can't tell if it's joyous or fleeing or even constipated. She'd do better, but it is fine. They are selling raspberry syrups, raspberry sorbets, even raspberry gazpacho. Imagine giving your whole life to the raspberry, your children's lives to the raspberry. Imagine mornings before dawn, shallow holes in good dark earth, pH balance, irrigation leaks, and harvesting, bending to the low soft rose at dusk, campaigns against worms, and eating the whole time raspberries. Were she still an artist, Nora would trouble this thought, something about biomes, droughts, the end of honeybees, and she'd think of a piece, a raspberry maybe, waist high and made of resin, resembling dinosaur bones, a whole show, natural history, the skeletons of raspberries, bees. Maybe she'd go home and think of making one, call someone who has better tools, a studio, and it'd eat her these next weeks, the obligation she would feel to a skeletal raspberry that did not exist and never had existed, and no one at all had ever asked her for, and when it failed, as she knows it would fail, the material problem requiring capital and the capital problem requiring attention that she had never gained, she would come to feel that she had failed, that she was bad and wrong and doomed because she had been obliged to give up on an idea, a beautiful idea, that had come to her one morning at the farmer's market. It is fine. Instead, she goes on through the sunlight. She buys a piece of goat cheese and a loaf of sourdough and circles back to see if the leopard jacket has turned any cheaper in her circuit. It has not, but that is fine. The whole day opens before her like a canvas, holding only Martin and sourdough, and tonight probably, after she bathes or watches television or maybe walks up through the hills, a glass of wine with Grayson, his warm and ample bed. You turn out to have an enormous amount of time when you are not trying to make art. <laughs> when you are not counting the days by what you painted or what sketches you made for what project, when you can find your value by who holds you in their arms and how safe you can feel, and not by whether gallerists with double-barreled names are interested in your work, or what corner with what pride of place they put it in. When you can live on the basis of your actual life, whatever its joys or pains, and not on some impossible problem of alchemy, on the question of what you might be able to transmute it into. And that other trouble, having torn time asunder, looking for an afikomen, you must then also sell it, convince someone that this thing you have made from the wreck of your own life is worth their time or money, which asking is related in some way to the life you appear to be living, for they will have researched you before deciding about your skeletal raspberry, not only your past shows, but your education and your associates, the photos that you post, where they will gauge the worth of your making by the perfection of the thing that you have made it from. There is a superficiality afoot, Nora thinks, in this art and everywhere, and it is not anyone's fault. It is not that anyone is bad. It is only that if you are leaving your life intact enough to be worth anyone's attention, it is hard for the work itself to do the worthing. Or at least that is how Nora understands it. Perhaps there are elegances she has not thought of. Perhaps the most followed artists are also the best people. Perhaps they have a kind of surplus, such that they can make their little paintings and attend their gorgeous candlelit dinners and pull loaves of picturesque bread from the oven and have the energy remaining somehow to live and to make art. Perhaps it is generational. Perhaps being 22 is all that anyone needs to know in order to live these shapes successfully. Nora does not have access to being 22. She does not have access to a childhood interpenetrated with communication, display, or curation. Perhaps it is easy if you are born to it. Here, from a novella called The Ruiners, is how each member of a broken-up couple, a photographer and a book editor, relates to making and in turn to time. What Grant had first noticed about Helen was the solemnity with which she returned each afternoon to her small, humid room to work on that write-up. In the first night's ayahuasca, he'd seen her tapping at a bright terminal whose packets flew direct to God, a kind of prayer he knew was closed to him, for what he believed in had no duration and did not set goals. 
Unlike Helen, he held no faith that anything, a world, self, career, would necessarily improve as it ate more time or care. Over time, he'd assessed her faith as a hangover, not from girlhood Protestantism, but the weightless solipsism of those 1990s suburbs, places where kids were taught that history had already occurred, they themselves were heroes, and all events only the expression of their own virtues. He'd throbbed and wavered through that life, raised by a single father and a stalwart Ford Ranger, following machinist work across the West to mines and factories and fields, and thin-walled short-stay housing, enrolling for odd months in schools with settled kids, well-dressed, hair-gelled, soccer-playing penitents, who knew every boon spoke their own perfection and bawled like animals at every setback, for it proved something was wrong in their own souls. He'd been given his first camera in one of these schools by a sixth grade art teacher who caught him staring out at Idaho instead of painting watercolors. He didn't want to make anything, he realized eventually, only to notice what the world contained already. Not, as Talia said, its general or abiding goodness, he was not so naive, only the glimpses of perfection that shone through to temper what was bleak. And so the dream he'd had that third night had been less revelation than reminder. He'd been flying, zooming, through sickening skins and strings of light, lassos and monstrous faces, toward some goal. But by great effort, he'd forgotten the goal, slowed, and found that each light, out of the terrifying constellations of velocity, was itself as beautiful as any goal could be. When someone, he didn't name it Helen until they were already in one another's arms, bolted through the door, he followed with the single purpose of sharing what in him was slow, had the capacity to halt. For that was his faith not an increase, but in gifts, miracles, kindnesses, the rattling ranger that didn't look like much, but managed always to smother you in warmth, grateful dead tapes to shout along with, the cab's brief back seat full of pillows, and when you awoke, a new and wondrous place you'd never been before. That was photography, a way of hunting these gifts of beauty or grace, and two, a way of holding them so that when you drove away in spring, you could still prove how perfect one life had been, and then the next might be as well. That last character and the next date for a while and then break up. Grant goes on to have a child named Carwin, and Helen goes on to be an editor. Helen's parents died. They'd been in that pickup truck towing the camper attachment downhill in the mountains east of Boise when they drifted off the road down 70 feet of good American Cretaceous scree and died. Helen flew to Houston, arranged and attended the funeral in a glaze, a churchyard cradled by pines, and the preacher's thin voice riding the roar of the freeway. Great Americans, he said. True patriots. Afterward, in the church's enormous reception room, Helen sat and withstood the congratulations of their friends, the Bible group, the golfers, leather-faced people in expensive sunglasses. Many were parents, people she remembered young and vital, people from the stands at volleyball games and graduations, whose sons and daughters she'd played checkers and doctor with, now making a small line to hug her and tell her how sorry they were, to say, real patriots, again, as though it were a kind of code or spell, something they hoped that she'd react to. She did not, fundamentally now she was alone, what had led to her was gone, and what she'd led to were only things, things and changes made beneath the names of others. Great patriots. They were people who'd gotten everything they wanted. Now, past the first shock of grief, she noticed that she loved them messily in fits and shakes and contradictions, how they'd bandaged her little wounds and taught her to stand up for herself, that she could be anything she wanted, and how they had also hated everything she wanted. And that was it. They'd made her and loved her, and then they'd started trying to destroy the world she'd have to live in. They'd gotten what they wanted there, too great patriots. She didn't cry until she was in the rented Honda, the church parking lot, and then less for the loss than the confusion. When she'd loved them, when she'd hated them, it had always told her who she was. And now? She stayed in Houston for a month after the funeral, working remotely, setting affairs in order, sleeping in her childhood bedroom. In there, the posters were curling, the old toys dusting in their cabinets, but the volleyball trophies shone. Someone had been polishing them, numbly, fathomlessly, the many griefs huddling into a single dark throb. She worked slowly through the big house, the sets of china, duck decoys, machines for a different decade's exercise. Strange, she thought, how love resolved into objects, and objects into work. On the roof of that bedroom, glow-in-the-dark stars still sketched a dim pony on the ceiling, and she woke many days in a panic, late for school, the bus sure to be grounded, but knew by the pain in her hips that she was an adult, an executive, and required nowhere. There were books there, too, books she'd loved in which children or animals left home, went to school or market, met difficulties, persevered and triumphed, because they themselves were good. Her parents had read these stories to her, and she'd believed them. Now they sat silent on the shelves, bound in gold or brown, drawings of bravery on the dust jackets, frail, all of them. The books and the children, frail too, the faiths and virtues, and frail the Helen who'd believed in them, who'd gone out proudly, and everything would need to be sold, sold or boxed, taken to storage or to her apartment in New York, where they'd stack and clog the hallway. All that faith, and all the love behind it, her whole life's vain belief, now stuck, old things, worthless to anyone but her. 
She'd have to bring it back to New York, she thought, to 8th Street. Could keep these things there, love them as they'd once loved her. And who'd care if she did? It was her own space, held room for her own strangeness. I'm going to skip to the very end. This is the thematic climax, though not the last event of the story processing. Um, <laughs> What Carla used to care about was Madoka Magica and different ways to make glittery slime at home and keeping an ordered list of the cutest dogs on Michel Terena. She liked cookies and not ice cream, and she liked yellow and not pink, and biology was her favorite class, and all of that was enough, so she followed the rules. When intruder protocol was announced over the intercom, she followed the rules. She was washing her hands in the girls' bathroom, and she didn't run back to class. She got on top of the toilet in the handicapped stall and stayed very silent, just like the rules said. She wanted to text Naomi to make sure they were both safe, but she had forgotten to charge her phone the night before, and just when she started sending the text message, the sad white wheel came up, and her phone died. It was two hours before the police came in and found her, and in that time, Naomi had sent her 32 text messages in increasing alarm, all of them wondering where she was and whether she was okay. People in social studies sent her another 15, and most of them sounded sure she was dead. She would have been the only one, and when she was finally led into the gymnasium with her shaking legs and the fingernails she'd almost bitten off entirely, the whole school cheered, but before they cheered, she caught some of them making a disappointed face. <laughs> some of them had wanted her to be dead, just to make a better story. Since then, Carla has felt sometimes that maybe she really did die there in the bathroom with no one around her but her dead phone. She feels like she turned into a ghost and like she deserves it. Actually, she hadn't forgotten to charge her phone, but forgotten, as she had been forgetting for some number of weeks, because talking about her dying phone had romantic charm, the same as the word tuberculosis, a charm that made her and her phone both sound desperate and a little dangerous, and also because she liked how it made them a team, a conspiracy, the phone doing its best to make the meager ration of electrons last until the bus ride home, and she, the user, doing her similar best to only call on said phone for particularly urgent tasks, like texts from Naomi and TikToks for which Naomi would respond with fire emoji. And when her phone died, usually sometimes after lunch, Carla was able to make complaints that sounded a little like mourning, which she found very mature. The other thing, though, was that she didn't know who was living and dying outside the bathroom. She just sat in there listening, flinching at each gunshot, wondering which one was killing Justin Violette, and which one was killing Mr. Collins, and which one was killing Naomi. She couldn't know was the thing. She was in a bathroom. She had no idea what was dying, and what was being killed, and what was disappearing forever, and what was just disappearing for right now. She didn't even know, at that time, which things she loved. It was only when people made things, like text messages or TikToks, that you knew they were alive. And it was only by making things that you could be sure you were yourself alive. After that, the girls burned the house down. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>